Alfredo Santa Ana, Colin Brown, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your Tuesday afternoon to have a little chat with me. I wanted to start uh, just just with you, Alfredo. Um, mm -hmm. You have a ton of diverse experience in music for film, music for electronic music. It sounds like there's a new album of electronic music coming out very soon. Um, and That's right. as well as what you called post-classical music. Your official bio begins in 2003 with your arrival in Vancouver and, and presumably the studies at UBC. But I'm sort of curious how you ended up in, in composition and especially as a guitarist, how you ended up writing so much for voice. Yeah, I mean, it's a long roundabout way of getting into Vancouver. You see, I, I was born in Mexico City and knew for early on that I wanted to go to university in the United States. And so I was able to do that. And I did so, and I didn't know what I was going to study, but I knew music was always going to be a part of my life growing up. I always enjoyed music, and I was played in bands and stuff like that. And I learned how to play uh, piano and guitar first, but I did um, end up eventually going to the U.S. And I studied music because I was able to get in and get a little bit of money because of my piano playing skills. I was very lucky to have had a bit of an entrance scholarship into a small liberal arts university in the middle of Missouri, which was amazing. It was a, a, a beautiful uh, learning and nurturing environment for music. And I very quickly switched into composition because I started hearing people that had been playing the piano since they were, you know, like five or six years old <laughs> and they had concertos under their, uh, you know, hands. And I was never, ever going to ever get that you know, get to play that well. So I switched to composition, just as a bit of a remedy, but I really enjoyed it. I took on to theory. And then when I started applying to all the different universities to uh, pursue a master's degree in composition, 9-11 um, happened around the same time. It was like 2001, two and three was when I graduated. And there were a lot of different changes in the American university laws, you know, wanting to see proof of funds. And I was like, you know, if I could pay for my master's right out of the gate, then I probably wouldn't need a master's right. degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I came, um, I also applied to um, Canada. I came to UBC, I visited, I really liked the city. This is a beautiful place to live in and a beautiful place to be at. And I thought if I could ever study here, I think it would be fantastic. So I came to Vancouver in 2003. And that's how I made my way here. I kind of buried myself into concert music, into proper kind of Western European styles of music. I had a lot of, you know, uh, my Latin American background gave me a lot of references for songs and everything, but um, I never really considered them to be that as significant as some of the European Western uh, masters that you know, I was taught in school. And hmm. now I'm kind of trying to reverse that by relearning a lot of the things that I used to know, and relearning a lot of songs that I learned when I was like, young, and um, a lot of Latin American rock that I grew up with that really influenced me. So I'm still trying to unearth all of these things and not necessarily unlearn what I've learned, but get to refamiliarize myself with uh, everything that really enriched me while growing up. Do you see yourself bringing that into the into your compositional practice now, or do you see it yeah. as a different avenue? It's a, I've I've struggled with this question a lot because it's a question of a, a little bit of identity, and it's a bit of a mixed identity for me because um, I remember when I came to uh, to study composition, you know, somebody one of the first composition teachers that I had said, "Well, you don't sound like you um, like you're from Mexico." And I remember thinking, oh, that's that's good. That's probably a really good thing because that means that I'm passing as like a composer that can write concert music. But then I also felt a little bit like, well, what am I supposed to sound like? What is a Mexican composer supposed to sound like? And, you know, there, there's all these references to uh, Revueltas or uh, Carlos Chavez and uh, great Mexican composers and Latin American composers. And I think people perhaps expected for my music to be more rhythmic or more colorful or uh, right. dance forward but um, yeah I just kept writing in the style that I kept writing and I'm still grappling with what does it mean to be a you know Mexican Canadian composer working and living in Canada and what that sound of the music should be. That's such a it sounds like a fun path to be on as much as it's it's alarming that you were put on that path in the first place it sounds like an interesting journey. 
It is. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what it actually means. You know, I just feel like there's there's a bit of cultural baggage that I, I want to embrace. And at the same time, I, I tried to push it away for so long because it, it's not like it's cool now, but it really, there has been, I think, a transition for a lot of people to, um, to engage with the different hierarchies that I think have been at play and all the different um, privileges that have come with studying, you know, Western concert music or European centered Western music. So yeah, I think there's just been a reframe lately that I'm really happy about and I look forward to keep exploring. Colin, I was reading an interview and you mentioned around 2007, you were starting to write for composers. And I'm just wondering how that sort of began. How did you make the transition from, from a fairly successful poet into a librettist? Yeah, I'm not sure it was, I'm not sure it was a transition. Um, I have been asked sort of over time to, this is an interesting question in a way of how do, how do writers and composers work? <laughs> um, and so I think typically, and in my experience, I would be asked for something um, or someone would read something and say, can I use it or can we use it? And, and, uh, and so that's, that's, that's really how it started in, in a way, in, in my experience. And I think in the experience of other poets that I know there's usually a, uh, an ask for a text, and then you never see the composer again for, for a while. <laughs> and she or he might call you up and say, what does this word mean? And what does that word mean? And you think, oh, that's an interesting question. That's a, why did I use that word? And then you have those conversations. And then you kind of hear the final uh, composition when you go to the launch. And so that's, that was more or less my experience most, most of the time, I'd, I'd have to say. And then, so when, when you started working with Alfredo, how did your guys' first collaboration come about? Um, well, Music on Main's office was in the same building where my little studio is huh. uh, at Main and Kingsway. And I'd known David Pay for some time. And so I would stop by the office on my way out for coffee or on my way back and just gossip a bit with them. And that's how I met Alfredo. Uh, so I got to know him a little bit. Then uh, we also somewhere in there, we did the Orpheus project. Remember Alfredo? We had fun doing that. That was, oh, really, it was very fun. I thought, a ter terrific experience. And uh, Alfredo and, and I remember, I don't know if you remember this Alfredo, but at a certain point we, you were working on the, on the sort of main theme for, for the piece. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling bold enough to come up to you, but not knowing what you'd think and saying, I think you should stop here. <laughs> I think, I think, I think you can end here. I and, don't remember that. Yeah. Um, and and uh, because you're sort of going to go through it one more time kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Easiest way to put it. The, the Orpheus project was this uh, awesome immersive project that Music and Main did back in 2014. And at the end, I remember you and Dave, um, Colin, you and Dave were talking about uh, doing a big sort of moment at the end um, mm -hmm. with a handle aria, and it was the sort of basis for this finale. So I took a motive of the handle aria and I recomposed it for the ensemble that was like prepared for the Orpheus project. And Colin translated, or you created an original text, right? Called for Pity Divine. Yeah. Yeah. So the aria takes on this completely different meaning because it's sung in English and it has to do with Orpheus and it has to do with, you know, all this beautiful ending to like a, an immersive musical theater type of evening. And I was a little bit, not necessarily, um, I don't remember the moment if you asked me, like, why don't we just end it there? But I probably was super happy because I was like, oh, good, less music. Let's, <laughs> let's just do it once through and that's it. <laughs> I'm I'm always open to suggestions and working with Colin has been um, really great in that way because I think that any, I feel really bad sometimes for like, you know, librettists and poets whose words are taken by somebody else and then chopped up, you know, chopped up in a way that uh, this, I'm just going to cut this word here, I'm going to cut this stanza, or I'm really going to take a long time here and not too long over here because then it's it's somebody else's work and I feel like when I get feedback from Colin I I get to make the piece better and there's relationships between text and music that actually function mm -hmm. better because 
I don't know there is everything there is to know about words and let alone music so it's it's always good to have a collaborator rather <laughs> rather than a you know just a person in one end of the of the process and then me coming in to complete it and then this this piece for musica intima when we approached you alfredo i think it was you who brought colin into the conversation from the get-go and you both decided yeah. that you wanted to do it a little differently right yeah i had just um i think we had just finished music for a night in may and um uh that was a big sort of long evening of um, music for um, uh, for poetry that Colin wrote and we did like three large pieces and I thought what would it be like if I wrote the music first and then let Colin listen to the music and then generate words from it because I I feel quite comfortable working with Colin and with his um, texts usually because they're very easy to generate music to. Um, I, lean to, um, I get influenced by some of the texts and then whatever helps me create music, that's what I'm gonna gravitate towards. And I find the way that Colin writes and um, his use of times and his use of references uh, to be sometimes so quick and it's a, they're very quick turns and it, it, the language seems very musical to me and the moments I think that Colin writes about um, are very easy to generate musical ideas too. So I was really interested in seeing like what Colin would come up with if he heard music first, because I can come up with some music for anything that he writes. Let's see if Colin can do the same, but with words. <laughs> the, the idea was to, um, to write a, a piece that I didn't know what the words were going to be in the end. So what I ended up doing was just creating a musical textures and a lot of different vocalizations that the choir could go through that would be easily read. And then we would go to a rehearsal, uh, sort of in a reading session type of scenario where you know uh, the ensemble just read it. And Colin and I were there. And so Colin, you were sitting there listening to this for the first time. I had an idea of how it was gonna sound, but from there, that's when you started writing the text, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so you had no discussion of, of themes or characters or anything like that beforehand? It was uh, against the law to have that conversation. Um, <laughs> because, so, I mean, but the really interesting thing is that <laughs> Alfredo and I were not allowed to talk about it because our deal was that I would compose something to the music he gave me. So he couldn't say, oh, when I wrote this, I was thinking about this, or when right. I wrote that, I was, I had this in mind. So it's very unusual. That, that's completely, you know, backwards to the way we usually work uh, because we discuss lots of stuff and then eventually we kind of I go back and try something or he tries something and you know we, we maybe think we know what each other wants but uh, but no so so this was I was I had to stay in the dark so what was the the I mean you devised this this two character story yeah what what was it that sort of you remember latching on to when, when you first heard things what drew you down the path the piece ended up on I think the idea for it being a duet came from what I heard that Alfredo gave me. Um, and and when, I came, when I had that idea, I thought, oh, would this be interesting for a choir? Would this be interesting for a group of singers to act somehow or find a way to be, uh, to sing a duet between two different characters? So that was that's one of the ideas. And then the other thing is that I, the same building on Main Street, <laughs> go back there again, I would come out for a cup of coffee or, or use something, uh, often late in the afternoon, I'd be working and I'd sort of work on into the evening, but I'd come out usually around 4, 4.30 or something. And at that time, they were building the, the big high rise up there. I saw lots of workers coming back and forth from there, many of them speaking Spanish. And, and I thought these guys are probably uh, men and women I've, I've seen. Um, I thought probably they're from Mexico, which made me think of Alfredo a little bit. Um, and then I thought about the kinds of conversations that a man and a wife has. Like the, I, I, and, and Alfredo and I had talked about migration before. It was It's one of the themes that's I think in our minds and uh, uh, in everybody's mind these days to a greater or lesser extent, it's, it's, it's what's happening in the world right now is a mass migrations. And so we had talked about this a little bit and I thought, well, 
hmm, these are these are guys, mostly men, coming here for work. I don't know where they live, but they can, I don't know how much they're getting paid. But I'll bet you they're trying to set, save and send lots of money home. And so they and I don't know if many of them have citizenship or what their situation is. Uh, so I thought they would have kind of a tenuous life, but they'd be earning money anyway. And somewhere at home, there'd be a family that they were supporting. And so those ideas sort of came forward to me. And, and I thought, well, what if we have a phone call? Well, what if we make a phone call between uh, a wife who's, and I imagined in Mexico, in a village somewhere, and her young husband, maybe 25, 26 here, working on this high rise, uh, while I go out for a cafe au lait. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so that, that, that's kind of how that came together. And then I, I checked, out with Al, what, checked it with Alfredo and I began to write something. And then the other thing was how much difficulty there is in terms of transmission, like you saying, hello, hello, can you hear the other person? Can you hear me? Hello, hello. So then that became a kind of motif for the piece, which was, yes, trying to reach across that distance in a short period of time, but the difficulty because of the phones and transmission and that kind of thing. Well, and it's so fascinating. I mean, we had sort of settled on coming back to this piece before a year ago, before the pandemic set in, but it, it's certainly appropriate now with all of the challenges of communication that we're experiencing now. I was, we were rehearsing a part of the piece the other night and I was like, oh, this is exactly like a Zoom glitch where <laughs> something's just sped up or slowed down or there's something jumping yeah. in, you don't quite catch it. It's like, yeah, this is, this is all of our lives now in a way. The um, I, I think when I started writing the um, the initial material, I was listening to a lot of uh, Joan LaBarbera and different 20th century improvisers that just do amazing things. And I, I did write some of those more like vocalizations and big leaps that sort of come out of nowhere and are slightly aleatoric in how they come in. And I think Colin latched onto that idea a little bit. We, we talk a lot about signals and we talk a lot about transmission and around, I, I think you mentioned something Colin and I think it made its way into one of the lines. I hear the signals between the stars. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that I remember the process then became like, there's, there's music that doesn't mean anything in a way, right? And it has no meaning. And then when you attach uh, text to it, all of a sudden then you frame everything that is happening, the emotional content, the, uh, uh, the phrasing, the speed, the tempo, everything then becomes about whatever is being sung. So it was an interesting translation, but I, once I had some of the text and once we started working in a more traditional way, I was able to either you know push a little bit more with those things or take a step back. And, and that's actually where some of the pauses came about, where uh, this idea grew of like creating a distance between the duet or between the men and the women in the ensemble mm -hmm. and making those distances slightly bigger every time that they present themselves throughout the piece. And so how much back and forth happened after, after the initial text and idea was set? Did then you allow yourselves to work together? Oh yeah. Oh, I yeah. mean, we, we were working just... <laughs> Just until uh, I, right before I sent you the piece this last December, um, because there's I really appreciate the opportunity to revisit the piece and understand the piece better. Because once you hear it in performance and you hear what some people have to say, um, I'm never close minded about like reworking things that I've done because it can only get better. I think um, there's the problem with that is that you would never really get to a final place. And it's really difficult then to censor yourself and say, no, it's, it's done. Let's, let's call this a finished piece. But then you guys were generous enough to like consider me doing some changes to it. And so Colin and I discussed, you know, word tweaks and different repetitions and stuff like that. And I considered some of the text a little bit more seriously. Like, for instance, there's this section that um, uh, I can't remember if it's the men or the women that start remembering an old waltz. Yeah. And I always struggled with that section knowing like, well, I'm, he, we're talking here about a waltz, we're, uh, a waltz, and one of them is remembering dancing with the other, but um, the piece is not in 3-4, it's still in 4-4, four, four. and so mm -hmm. I, I kept it in 4-4 four, four on purpose because it's a way of representing a past that's no longer here, but somebody that's really trying to remember, and so I was able to sort of like push a little bit more with some of those text music relationships that 
maybe are not even apparent when you listen to them, but for the composer knowing that that's mm. how it's written, I, I take a lot of meaning from that. So it was, it was good to work with Colin again with that. Well, and certainly, I, I mean, I, I had a few small musical thoughts that, that I thought were worth putting in. And when I got the revised piece from you, there was substantial work <laughs> done on it. Oh, right. um, the right. ending, especially, I, I'm sure like it's, it's, a big, it's a big reworking of, yeah. of what was there before. Yeah. I think it's. I think it will be even more effective, and it was already quite an effective piece. So I'm. I'm excited awesome. to premiere the new version. I, I have to say too. I should. It's, I think poets typically tend to write far too much when they're asked to write for music. I will have <laughs> to include myself in that. Way too much, um, and uh, so that's something I've had to learn. And, and Alfredo's been a good teacher for me with that. And uh, so I think some of this has been trimmed down now. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope it's I hope it's more open uh, <laughs> with those with those spaces between them with that lack of transmission. Hello, mm -hmm. hello, like, what? oh hello, and then coming in and then saying you know and then talking maybe you know sometimes we talk. It's just it's always fraught in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that what starts out as a reaching out becomes frustrating, and then. And then the times out and that kind of thing. So, so it has yeah. all of those tensions in it. Yeah, one well, that the you bring up the silences, which I find super fascinating. It's going to be difficult, and and Alfred, I actually want to talk to you after about a few technical things. But um, yeah, totally. It's the silences are going to be difficult on tape. But but one thing I've discovered as we've been working through the piece is that it's almost more important than the silence itself. It's the attack of the silence. What's mm -hmm. the what's the cadence of the last line? What's the mm. Are you crashing yeah. into a wall? Are you releasing something into an open space? Are you falling over? Like it's, I think there's so much potential there mm -hmm. in every note. It's so well crafted that way. Yeah, totally. I, you bring up a really good point because this is a digital broadcast. And so the piece is going to be seen on video, right? So there's no, um, it's going to change the perception of those uh, lagoons of time because all of a sudden you're going to be there waiting for something while not really feeling like you're in the room waiting with everybody which is part of the thing that I miss the most right now about concerts, obviously, but uh, composition and those starts and those stops uh, that you're referring to, it's, it's kind of like what the whole enterprise of composition is about, right? Creating starts and stops that create meaning, you know, graceful starts and graceful stops that somehow result in someone having some kind of interaction with those starts and those stops. And in a sense, the video is going to be kind of tricky with those pauses, for sure. Um, the idea, though, is to perceive them as getting longer and longer and bigger and bigger. Colin, I found a, a quote from you online here from a 2007 Pacific Rim review of books. And you said, I've also been exploring a way that I can sew into the narratives many times and many places simultaneously. What that means is being able to identify the temporal and geographical intersections I'm the sum of, intersections, by the way, that continue to accumulate voluntary and involuntarily, and which are inseparable from language. Mm. And so I'm wondering if that's, you're talking about yourself there, and specifically about a, a yeah. book that was semi-autobiographical at least, but I wonder if you find that interesting in looking at other people's stories as well, and, and how that found its way into this text and into this piece. Mm. That's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I'm still in my, my recent book, um, there's there's a great deal. I, I feel the past is always immediately in the present with the present. That's a, I, I don't, it's not that it's compressed, it's not that it, it's a pancake, but that I really don't, I don't get past and I mean, and, and present perhaps in the way we like to think of as a, as a linear thing. So to me, the, 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 the moment we're in is already saturated with lots of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, as a life is and as language is, because language, what's, what's more saturated than language in many respects, uh, the, the way we understand words and well, I could go on for a long time. So <laughs> um, I think in, in this one, in, in this one, you have these two, you know, you have two people that are very far away in terms of distance. They're very close in terms of their hearts, but they can't, <laughs> how can they express? They can't touch one another. Uh, and, and the, the equipment keeps cutting out. Uh, and so they're both present and not present. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of brought home in that sense. They've got each other in, in their imaginations. They're in each other's lives, 
but whenever they try to really connect up, something happens and changes it. It's about two people who are intimately wrapped together and yet can't, can't really touch one another because of distance, but also because of economies, also because of capitalism, also because of the nature of the migrant worker. Uh, and when you look at all the, <laughs> when you look at all the great buildings, buildings that the tourists go and look at were made by slave labor um, or, or by migrant labor. And yet we go and say, oh, look at this glorious building. Or as we know in England, you go and look at a great house in England if you're so inclined. And it was all built essentially on the backs of slaves. Uh, and so in a sense, this piece is also about that, about how circumstance, economic circumstances where you happen to get born, be, be born, uh, and into what class you were born, sends this guy up to work in Vancouver <laughs> uh, on this building. Luckily, there are other guys like him. Uh, perhaps that helps a bit, but um, it's, so it, it's also about all of those market forces, all of the ways that, um, that one group of people use another group of people. <laughs> it does, the piece does have a few sort of extended vocal techniques, Alfredo. So I wonder if you would give us just a little primer on some of some of what you're expecting the voices to do and what you were hoping to portray through that. Oh, um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I think I was listening to uh, Joan LaBarbera do all these fantastic improvisations and vocalizations that, um, you know, similar to John DeGaetani and other um, singers were very fluid and very, um, how should I say, very flexible with the way that they were using vibrato and non-vibrato. And I'm kind of a stickler with vibrato. I always talk about how I, I dislike the excessive use of vibrato that sometimes is built into the repertoire of opera. And so I try to make use of that a lot in terms of the, mm -hmm. uh, the different variation of um, vibrato. And some of the extended technique, I think also perhaps has to do with um, the language itself. Um, one of the cool things is that when Colin heard this, uh, we talked about maybe doing it in different languages because it really was a work of translation. I think that Colin was engaged in with like translating this recording that I gave him and that experience of listening to the music in the first place and putting words to it. So we settled on at least a couple of words in Spanish, French and, and English. And so some of the extended technique, I think also has to do with exploiting some of the phonemes of Spanish, like the ñ sound. So doing a lot of ña, 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 and using more nasal type of quality to move and transition from this. Um, I mean, in the end, it ended up being like this distortion or this like glitch transmission effect of like a phone call, maybe the static or the noise, white noise mm -hmm. behind a, a phone call. But originally it was just, you know, trying different things with a great group of singers that were willing to read a piece to a poet and a composer. So <laughs> that's really where the extent of the extended techniques came. If there's something you would want the audience to take away, just just one thing you want the audience to take away from the performance, what would it be? Hmm. Colin, you go first. <laughs> I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> oh, well, you know, as when I'm in the audience, I, I can be listening. I can be listening four and two technique or, you know, what, <laughs> there, there are different ways of approaching it. But I would really like to think that when someone hears this, they hear this duet and they're moved by it. And they say, hmm, I know this. I know this feeling. I've had this feeling here. And I think maybe during the pandemic, as you said, Alfredo, mm -hmm. this is perhaps more pertinent than ever in the sense, reaching out to one another. I'd really like someone to come away with the feeling to have a, had a sense that this is a, a conversation between these two people who love one another and how, and how, how they're trapped in this system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's lovely. Um, I was thinking when you said that, that I, I wish the same thing. I, I want people to come away with that, um, with that knowing, but the realization, and I think, this is a piece about communication or the lack of communication or the tearing or uh, fraying of that communication of what a long distance relationship can be like. And there's these streams of communication always all around us happening between people. There's Zoom conversations happening all around. 
there's um, communication, even when we're all together, there's certain looks, body language that everybody's communicating all at the same time. And there's some really wonderful streams of communication that I think we all ought to be uh, listening for. And, mm -hmm. and in some way, not necessarily enjoying, I don't think it's a, I don't, I don't think like enjoyment out of this stream of communication is a, is a goal or an objective, but just, just paying attention to the different streams of communication that are always going on around us uh, just makes us, I think, more um, accountable for mm -hmm. what it is that we're communicating and what it is that we're hearing, which is a lot, I think, to try to get out of a <laughs> listening of a piece. Well, but that's but, the two uh, that's the two sides of the piece, right? It's the emotional punch, but also the the observing and and sort of the clinical observation yeah. of what's going on and yeah. and actually taking that into account.